Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 40. In this lecture, we'll discuss the Parallel Axis Theorem. This topic is covered in Chapter 10, our textbook by Surway and Jouette. To discuss the rotational behavior of an object, we need to know its moment of inertia. Recall that the moment of inertia essentially tells us how much force it takes to rotate an object. We'll make that idea much more precise a little bit later, but for now, we just want to make sure that we can calculate the moment of inertia precisely. Here is the formula for the moment of inertia, and note that the axis of rotation is extremely important. In this formula, you must be able to calculate the distance of each point of the object relative to the axis of rotation, more precisely, the shortest or the perpendicular distance to the axis of rotation. Therefore, how you rotate the object, in other words, your choice of the moment of the axis of rotation, will determine the precise value of the moment of inertia. To understand the importance of the axis of rotation, consider the object shown here. What we have here is a rectangular prism or a cuboid and its length, width, and height are labeled simply as A, B, and C. Suppose we want to calculate the moment of inertia of this object. The first question we would have to ask is, how is the object rotating? Or how do we intend to rotate this object? There are many different ways that this object can be rotated. We can imagine rotating this box relative to the x-axis, or the y-axis, or the z-axis. In these animations, you can see the object rotating in three distinct ways. In each animation, we have exactly the same box with the same mass and the same dimensions, but on the left, we're rotating it around one axis, let's call it the x-axis, whereas in the middle, we're rotating the same object relative to the y-axis, and here, we're rotating the object around the z-axis. Although it's exactly the same object in all three cases, the moment of inertia is going to be different for each case. The formula is the same. It's 112 times mass times some dimensions squared, but numerically the moments of inertia will be different because in each one of these formulas, we're using a different length or width or height. So it's important to realize that the moment of inertia of an object is not just a property of that object, it's a property of the object and the particular axis of rotation that you have chosen. In our last lecture, I showed you a table that listed the moments of inertia for various important objects. You may have noticed that in that table, in almost all the cases, the objects were rotating about an axis that passed through the center of mass of the object. The question now is, what if the axis of rotation does not pass through the center of mass of the object? What if the axis of rotation is displaced relative to the center of mass? This is a common case, and we need to be able to calculate the moment of inertia for these situations. To do so, we use the parallel axis theorem. If the inertia about an axis through the center of mass is denoted by ICM, then the inertia about any other axis that is parallel can be calculated using this formula here. So what we have in mind is a situation like this. Imagine some arbitrary shape, some solid object of any shape you please. Imagine the center of mass of the object is located here, and imagine this is an axis of rotation that is passing through this center of mass. Suppose you've already done a series of calculations and you figured out what the moment of inertia of the object is relative to the center of mass. Now suppose someone comes along and says, I don't want to rotate this object relative to this axis. Instead, I want to rotate it relative to this other axis. Notice the second axis does not pass through the center of mass, but it is parallel to the first axis of rotation. In this case, you can use the parallel axis theorem. If you've already calculated the center of mass moment of inertia, all you have to do is add md squared to it. 
m is the total mass of the object, and d is the distance, the shortest distance or the perpendicular distance between the two axes of rotation. Here's an example of how the parallel axis theorem can be used. On the left, we have an object and it is rotating about the Z axis. Notice that the axis of rotation on the left passes through the center of the box. We can say it passes through the center of mass of the object. Suppose you've already calculated the moment of inertia of the object for this particular axis. The formula turns out to be 1 12th m times the quantity a squared plus b squared. Now suppose you want to take the same object and you want to rotate it differently. Here's the new rotational configuration on the right. We are rotating still around the z-axis, but notice now the z-axis is no longer passing through the center of mass. In fact, on the right, the axis of rotation is not passing through the object at all. In this case, we can use the parallel axis theorem. We notice that the new axis of rotation is parallel to the old axis of rotation, so we can take the moment of inertia relative to the center of mass and simply add md squared to it. m is the total mass of the object, and d is essentially the distance between the new axis of rotation and the old axis of rotation, which used to pass through the center of the object. Let's end this lecture with a practice problem. Earth can be modeled as a sphere with a radius of 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters approximately and a mass of 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms approximately. Earth's orbit about the sun can be modeled as a circle with a radius of approximately 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. Based on this information, calculate the Earth's moment of inertia about its daily axis of rotation. Notice that the Earth has two axes of rotation. It has the daily axis of rotation, which is responsible for day and night, and the daily axis of rotation passes through the North Pole, the center of the Earth, and then the South Pole. So we can say that the daily axis of rotation passes through the center of mass of the Earth. To calculate the Earth's moment of inertia about this axis of rotation, we turn to our book, we look up the formula for the moment of inertia of a sphere. We find it is 2 fifth mr squared. We substitute the numbers in, and we find that its moment of inertia is approximately 9.83 times 10 to the 37 kilograms meters squared. As it turns out, the Earth has a second axis of rotation. The Earth is also rotating about the sun, so we can imagine a second axis of rotation passing through the sun with the Earth orbiting the Sun. So continuing the same problem, part B asks us to calculate the Earth's moment of inertia about its annual axis of rotation. The annual axis of rotation is different from the daily axis of rotation. Daily rotation is responsible for day and night, whereas annual rotation uh, is responsible for the months and the seasons as the Earth orbits the Sun once every year. The daily axis of rotation passes through the center of mass of the Earth, but the annual axis of rotation passes through the Sun and is approximately parallel to the daily axis of rotation. To calculate the new moment of inertia, we need to use the parallel axis theorem. ICM is the moment of inertia relative to the center of mass, which is simply equal to 2 fifth mr squared. We calculated this quantity in part A, and we now need to add to it md squared. m is the mass of the Earth, and d is simply r2. In other words, it's the radius of the annual circle of the Earth around the Sun. Plugging in the numbers, we find that the moment of inertia of Earth around this annual axis of rotation is approximately 1.337 times 10 to the 47 kilograms meters squared. Incidentally, notice that when we're doing the calculations, the moment of inertia relative to the center of mass is a very small number compared to md squared. Certainly 9.83 times 10 to the 37 is a big number, but compared to this second number, it's quite small. 
this second number is 10 to the 47th. It's approximately 10 orders of magnitude bigger. It's approximately 10 billion times bigger. And so when we add these two numbers together, this first number essentially gets lost in the shuffle which suggests that we could have simply ignored the moment of inertia of the Earth relative to the daily axis of rotation. In a sense, we can say that the radius relative to the Sun is so much larger than the radius of the Earth that we can essentially model the Earth as a point particle in this particular problem. That's not always the case, but in this particular case, if we had modeled the Earth as a point particle, with a negligible center of mass inertia, we still would have gotten a very accurate result. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.